Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're gonna to be talking about tools. I've never gotten a chance to do a thorough rundown of all of the different materials that I use for one of my life-size prop builds, and I've been getting a ton of questions about things, so I figured now would be the perfect time to make a video like this. So here are all of my must-have tools and tips for life-size prop building. Let's start off with printers, because at this point, I basically am constantly printing my prop builds that never used to be the case but I just don't have time to scratch build everything now and the technology is there and it's awesome so why not take advantage of it. I've accumulated quite a collection and I guess print farm you could call it because on top of prop building and 3d printing being one of my favorite hobbies it also is very intertwined with a lot of my work now and so I've had to accumulate quite a collection to keep up with production of various things. So I still actually use my very first 3D printer that I ever bought, which was a Creality CR-10S. At this point, I think the only original part of my CR-10S might be the frame because I've done so many upgrades and customizations and repairs on it that nothing is original. But I still use this printer all of the time. I've gotten it to be really reliable over time with all of my different upgrades and stuff. And so while I don't think you can actually buy an original CR-10S now, there's lots of like newer models and iterations of it that are still available. I then have three different Ender 3s. My first one is an Ender 3 Pro, which again has had a lot of different modifications and changes put on it. I could do an entire video of all of the printer upgrades that I do to my machines, so if you're interested in that, definitely let me know. Now my other two Enders are the only 3D printers that I have that are the exact same, and they are two Ender 3 V2s. Even though I don't think they are 100% the exact same, because one of them I bought almost a year before the other, so there were a couple of different changes that they made to each models, and again you probably can tell that I have made various upgrades and adjustments to them from the stock models. And these Ender 3 V2s tend to be my go-to printer. When I'm working on a prop build, I tend to go and slice it for one of the Enders, and then if it doesn't fit on one of those, then I will use my CR-10S. My Ender 3 Pro and CR-10S also tend to have 0.8 nozzles on them, so the second I don't want something printed with a 0.8 nozzle, then it immediately goes on the Ender 3 V2s. And if you're someone that's looking at possibly buying a printer to start prop building, a lot of the different Ender 3 models would be great starter options. I wouldn't go for anything older than an Ender 3 V2 at this point, and then there's even newer versions of the V2, and even some more upgraded models like the Ender 3 S1 and S1 Pro. This isn't going to be like a crazy in-depth video about my printer recommendations. This is just what I'm using right now for my prop work. Now there are some projects where you will see me use all four of these printers at the same time in some cases if I'm really trying to get things printed fast. And in terms of the filament that I use for my projects, it's been a range over time. I have printed full droids in like the cheapest PLA that I can get from a local shop. It's like the value PLA. And more recently, I've been using Duramic PETG. And I'm also a big fan of the PLA Plus from Duramic. It's super, super nice. And if you aren't quite at the point of wanting to mess around with PETG, the PLA Plus is seriously probably the strong longest filament I've ever seen. I printed something one time and it accidentally created like a blob on the top of the piece and I like could not cut it off. That is how strong this filament is. I also really like the Eason PLA Plus and I have quite frequently in the past used the AMZ 3D PLA and PLA Plus as well. I would say whatever kind of filament that you can get fairly easily and that is a decent price point for you that prints reliably is going to be 
perfect for prop building. The PETG I just started to use because of its easier sandability, which it is beautiful to sand. And technically the PETG and PLA Plus do afford a higher temperature threshold, but honestly, if you're putting enough walls in the piece, then regardless of the material, it's not gonna melt and deform or do any weird stuff like that. At this point, I do also have a collection of resin printers or SLA printers. At any given point, you might see me using all of these as well for a single prop build. So I have an Elugu Mars 2 Pro. As of last week, I also now have a Mars 3 Pro, although that hasn't seen any prop pieces yet. I also have an Anycubic Mono X and an Anycubic M3 Max. And very similarly to how I approach my FDM printers, if I can fit it on the Mars 2 Pro, then I will most likely print it on that one. If I can't, then I will jump it up to the Mono X. And if it won't fit on the Mono X, then I will put it on the M3 Max. And pretty much every resin piece that I have printed for a prop has been done in the Elegoo ABS like in gray. It's a really easy color to see details and lines on. It looks really good just straight off of the printer when it's like a mid-tone gray color. So therefore it also looks good on camera when I'm filming all of these prop builds. And overall the gray, it just prints really easy. It tends to go on sale quite frequently and everything's getting painted anyway, so it really doesn't matter what color it is. Same goes for the filament. Sometimes you will see me use the odd end of a roll in an unusual color, but for the most part, I will most likely be printing my prop pieces in black, white, or occasionally gray. Like 95% of the time it is black unless whatever piece I'm working Working on actually is something that is white. Like, for instance, I printed a BB-8 all in white pieces so that the interior of the model was actually white, so it just sort of looked more put together instead of having to worry about painting all of the inside of the panels and stuff. So unless the thing that I'm making is actually white, then it will be whatever other color. But I do really like black for the same reason as the white, as it's just really clean inside. You know, if you have a helmet, then it's just like a nice dark uniform color that then you don't have to worry about painting or like being weird about seeing like a lime green strip on the inside or anything like that. So those are all of the 3D printers that I'm using right now for my prop builds. But now let's get into some support removal tools because lots of the time your pieces are going to have some sort of support that then needs removing in a reasonable fashion. Of course, the first thing would be pliers. Having a few different size options is always useful because there will always be some weird print that you make that has a very fine channel or just some annoying little cavity that you have to try and get into and one pair of pliers won't work. So these two are probably my most frequently used. This is just a pretty generic needle nose plier situation. So making sure that the pliers that you have for support removal have a bit of like teeth or texture on the inside and aren't just smooth is gonna make your life a whole lot easier. And then I have this pair of really fine pliers that are great for getting into those really tiny annoying sections. They will come in super handy. Another tool that I use all of the time is a deburring tool. Deburring tools are great for removing brims. I tend to print my pieces with small brims on them just to make sure that no corner lifting or anything is happening like that. It uses up a really Really small amount of material and it just can save a whole lot of hassle later on. This one actually has a specific plastic deburring tip to it. Uh, the typical standard um, ones that I believe are normally meant more for brass or at least metal will work, but the one that is more plastic specific has a finer end, and so it's much easier to get into like little crevices on prints and stuff. And for the even more difficult supports to remove, I have some just angle cutters, like the kind you get with any 3D printer basically, and one of these little spatula scraper things that again, both of these tend to 
to be very frequently uh, included with 3D printers, so you probably have a couple of extra ones laying around if you have a couple of printers and whatnot. But I will say as a side note, making sure you have some sort of decent pair of gloves for support removal can also be incredibly important because that plastic can get incredibly sharp and it will slice you up every chance you can get. So do your hands a favor and even get just like a really basic pair of work gloves like this if you don't want anything too bulky. Something like this is still better than nothing and will save your hands in the long run. Something that is more resin support removal specific would be this little heat gun pen. This is one of my absolute favorite tool finds for 3D printing. It makes removing resin supports so, so much easier. Heating resin supports up makes them fall off so easily. It causes a whole lot less damage to the surface of the print. Hot water also works really well or just a normal heat gun. I just have this small little one because it's a lot easier to keep in my workshop and this gives off more than enough heat to very easily remove supports and I also don't have to worry about like excessive heat from a heat gun going possibly too far around my work area and maybe melting something that I don't want it to. So this is just a really handy and also inexpensive tool to have around. Also I'll be putting everything that I talk about in this video in the description box because off the top of my head I don't know what every single brand of a product that I use is so I will be making a very thorough list in the description box if you are interested in one of the tools that I talk about. For the printed pieces the next step after support removal would be smoothing which is by far the most tedious part of 3D printed prop making and I have quite a collection of tools to assist me in that and try and make that process as easy as possible. First of all actually this little tool bucket I think it's actually like an electrician's uh, grab bag or something but it's awesome for holding all of the little tools and bits that I need for like every prop build and since I don't really have a permanent setup right now it's super convenient to just be able to put everything in here and pick it up and take it around to where I need it and know that absolutely everything that I need is in this thing. So highly recommend this little bucket contraption as well. The first smoothing tool that we're going to talk about is honestly probably my favorite tool that I use for 3D printed props. It is easily the thing that has made the biggest difference in my workflow and if there's any tool that I talk about in this video that you should get, it is this if you don't already have one. But it is this electric foot sander callus remover. I know it's an incredibly strange recommendation, but it is the greatest sanding tool you will ever own for 3D prints. I think every single person that I have convinced to get one of these for sanding 3D prints has absolutely loved it. It does have an adjustable speed setting, but even at the highest setting it doesn't go so fast that you have to worry about melting the plastic accidentally. It uses the these foam backed adhesive sandpaper discs that come in a couple of different grits. The foot sander itself tends to come with a pack of like a hundred I want to say which you will not go through fast at all. I have been using this thing non-stop for every project that I've worked on since I've bought one which I think at this point is over a year ago and I don't know if I've used 20 of the discs. You really do not go through them fast. You could technically DIY your own discs, although I will say it really needs cushioning. I have tried just sticking like adhesive sandpaper onto the metal part and it did not go great. So if you're using like velcro sandpaper discs, the velcro itself might be enough cushioning, but other than that if you're going to use like adhesive sandpaper, like cutting down one of the bigger sanding discs of adhesive sandpaper, put some like foam stickers or something on to the actual piece because the cushioning is what makes this thing work even better. It's just such a great tool and also not incredibly expensive. I think they tend to be around the like 40 Canadian dollar mark which is like 30-ish US dollars. So a pretty reasonably priced tool, definitely a lot cheaper than like a mouse sander and other sanding tools that I personally do not think work as well as this. One million percent recommend the electric foot sander. Another tool that I use a lot for smoothing and also for a lot of other work on props would be this hot knife. 
This is a walnut hollow multi-tool that you can interchange the tip out to be a lot of different things. I also use this for soldering right now, even though I have an actual soldering iron. This is just very convenient. This particular model has an adjustable dial for different heat settings, and hot knife with interchangeable tips is just a really great tool to have around. It will come in handy for a ton of different things. I do use this a lot for smoothing out like the rough areas left behind from support material, but it's also great to make adjustments and even actually assemble pieces together, like plastic weld the individual pieces together. It's just a very versatile tool and one that you will most likely find a lot of different uses for with various prop builds. Of course, for smoothing, I do use a lot of other more traditional sanding methods like sandpaper in every grit imaginable at this point. Files in various sizes can also be super handy with grinding down incredibly rough areas on prints and just getting into little nooks and crannies. For smaller areas, this little sandpaper belt tool is also super handy, as well as sanding twigs. They come in a lot of different grits and are just great to get into those little annoying spots where you really can't get sandpaper or anything else into. Of course, sanding is not the only step in getting smooth finishes on prints. I go through a ton of a ton of filler primer. This Duplicolor stuff is what I've been using basically because it's pretty much the only filler primer that I can get locally. No complaints for me. It works great. I have at this point probably gone through more than 50 cans of the stuff, but filler primer is definitely a more expensive type of spray paint. So on top of this for smoothing, I also use Mondo Spot Putty. I used to use this straight out of the tube, but but lately I've been mixing it with acetone so that it's easier to actually brush on with a paintbrush and that's been working absolutely amazingly. I'm not sure if I'm ever really gonna go back to using it straight from the tube unless it's something really deep that needs that thicker consistency. A less toxic alternative to the Bondo Spot Putty would be very specifically this type of wood filler. This is this Elmer's Color Changing Wood Filler, which I know people have said is not particularly easy to find certain places. Honestly, it's not particularly easy to find in Canada either. But for the most part, I believe that all color changing wood fillers have this consistency and it's the consistency in this case that counts. The color changing stuff is just completely plasticky. It is unlike every other wood filler that I tried. There's, there's not a single speck of wood dust in this stuff, which means it goes on way smoother than traditional wood filler. You can smooth the stuff out with water. It sands beautifully. It sands very similarly to the spot putty. And if you are using something like this, buying a pack of these blank like credit cards, these are like the easiest, cheapest, and best scraper you can get. I will cut these down to size for whatever project I need. You can get a pack of more than you will probably ever need in your lifetime for really cheap, and they can come in handy for a lot of different prop building uses. I also use my DIY UV resin filler all of the time. Very professionally labeled here. I have it in this metal container because it's completely UV, like sealed off. So what this is is UV printer resin mixed with fumed silica to make it thicker. I did use baby powder a lot in the past, which absolutely still works. I don't really have a specific recipe ratio. I actually will vary it depending on what I'm covering up and working on. Sometimes I will want it to be a bit thinner, and other times I will need it thicker if I'm adding like texture to a print. I use this to texture out Plo Koon's head to give it a skin texture, which worked amazingly. But I tend to just mix up little leftover bits of resin bottles of colors that I I'm not going to use for anything else, so the color of this will change over time. It's a lot tougher than something like the spot putty, so I find that this is how you get rid of seam lines a lot easier. The Bondo, you will still see little lines of where the pieces will connect, but this will make it completely disappear. So if you have some UV printer resin laying around, 
find some baby powder or something to mix into it and try it out. It's seriously incredible and such an easy thing to do. And of course with that you will need some sort of UV light. I just have one of these very typical standard portable ones. I'll just move this around all over the piece once I have applied a layer of the resin filler, which does not take on like a few seconds all over the piece and everything will be hardened. To apply the resin filler I tend to use just cheap paintbrushes that I don't care about, but I also really like these tiny foam applicators. They're great for just filling in those little dimples that are sometimes left over from resin supports. A foam brush also works well, I just tend to prefer the paint brushes because I find that the foam brush almost soaks up too much of the resin filler and doesn't really apply it on the piece. For deeper surface imperfections like drainage holes on resin prints, I really like using green stuff. It's great to fill in larger gaps like between pieces if they maybe don't fit very well. This is just really convenient to have on hand for those larger gaps that you need to fill in. Now even with all of those I still have quite a few other miscellaneous tools in this bucket. The first thing is a very necessary safety item that I probably should have put sooner in the video but that is a good respirator mask. I've had a couple over time but this one is definitely my favorite. It is, I did write it down, the Rugged Comfort Quick latch. This one right now has dust filters on it because I was using it to sand drywall, but you can get like the vapor filters. That is what you would more typically see and should be using for like paint spraying and stuff. Although for sanding, this would be fine. But this one is just super comfortable. I'll put it on. So one sec. So this just feels very secure on your face. It also does not create any steaming up of the glasses, which can be incredibly annoying. But the very unique feature that I really like about this mask is it has a quick release, which the name would suggest. So you can be in the middle of working on something and if you want to take like a drink or just have a nice breath of fresh air or whatever, it's very easy to just pull the lever thing up and then when you're done with whatever you're doing, you just put it back on like that. A respirator is obviously an incredibly important safety tool to have and so having one that you are very comfortable in is absolutely a necessity because it means that you will be more likely to put it on when you need it and you will be put having one on for very prolonged periods of time and you want to be comfortable for that. But something that's another wearable item would be an apron which I don't actually have with me because it'd be incredibly awkward to try and hold it up but specifically it is this under NY Sky apron. It has legs and let me tell you, an apron that has legs on it will be a game changer with the amount of sanding that you will inevitably be doing. I got really tired in coming away from an afternoon of sanding, having my legs be completely covered in sanding dust. And while this apron doesn't eliminate that completely because some of the dust is so fine that it sort of goes through the fabric, it is like 80% better than not having an apron that has legs. So while I do really like that particular apron, just in general an apron with legs I think will be one of the best purchases that you can make with the amount of sanding that you will inevitably be doing when working on these larger prop builds. Another wearable item that is definitely more of an unusual recommendation would be compression sleeves. Now as I mentioned many a time you will be doing a lot of sanding and with all of that sanding comes arm fatigue. And if you're somebody like me that is very prone to like tendonitis and things, the compression sleeve will do your body so much good. So these have definitely made my arms feel a lot better supported and in a lot less pain, which is always a good thing. I forgot to mention these earlier, but specifically in the glove department, I really love these MaxiFlex gloves. They are very, very heat resistant so I will use them all of the time when I'm using my hot knife and they come in a ton of different sizes which is very important because I have quite small hands and so 
when gloves start at a size medium or large, that does not help me out. And it is important that your safety wear is well fitting to you. And these are very comfortable. They do the job incredibly well. They're also really good to use for printer maintenance, like when you're dealing with any of the like nozzle components, changing that out. One of my favorite types of gloves, I've gone through many a pair of them and have a pair of these in lots of different places in my workshop and studio area. This is definitely a luxury item, I would say. This is an electric air duster. It is incredibly powerful. But what I use this for is blowing off sanding dust, especially when you have a respirator on. You can't exactly blow on the piece you're working on to remove the dust when you want like spray filler primer on it and you don't want there to be dust particles all over the piece. It's incredibly powerful, so it like completely removes any dust and debris that might be still stuck to the piece that you're working on, which you definitely do not want to have on the piece when you're maybe going from sanding it directly into adding spray primer. I do still tend to wipe down pieces with a damp cloth just to make sure everything is fully off, but really this thing does remove like 95% of the dust on pieces, especially when it goes to its highest setting. It's like a full-blown hurricane. Yes, this is a bit of an extravagant item, but I do use it all the time, so I wanted to mention it. Also for dust removal, have like a clean separate toothbrush just to you know brush it off like an archaeologist super handy great for little crevices and resin prints especially other convenience things would be these squeeze bottles I have these all over the place this has water in it for airbrushing this has alcohol in it for cleaning resin prints really inexpensive you will tend to get a pack of them with more than you will ever need but definitely very very useful items to have in your workshop. Another bottle that I have all over the place are these needle tip bottles. This one has black tape all over it because it actually has UV resin in it, so I've tried to block out all of the light as best as I possibly can. But I have these, again, with a bunch of different stuff in them. They're great to have a little bit of resin in for any repair work. The nozzle is super fine. It comes with a little nozzle cap too, which is really convenient because then you don't have to worry about it leaking everywhere. But these are also incredible to put masking fluid in, which we will get into in a bit, but again, just a really handy bottle to have around. Pipettes are also incredibly useful to have around for a variety of different reasons. These ones I've been using for paint, like getting it out of bottles and into my airbrush, but I have one to get the acetone out of the bottle, put resin in things, just so many different things that you will need to try and do when prop building that a pipette is going to be the easiest way to achieve that task. So definitely have some around your workshop because you will most likely need them at some point. Another just all around useful tool to keep around are these one, two, three blocks. These are incredibly heavy. I want to say they're made out of steel, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But they're just solid metal blocks that are one inch by two inch by three inch that are just so handy for so many different purposes. They're great to use as weights if you need to weigh like a piece that you're gluing together down. You can prop stuff up with them, line things up with them. So handy to have around for so many reasons. Which, speaking of gluing things together, let's talk about some adhesives. As a general rule, I keep pieces as small as I possibly can for as long as I possibly can. It is so much easier to sand things when they're smaller. You don't have to worry about accidentally breaking the piece that you've glued together when you're sanding and working on it. So I try and get all of the smoothing work done other than the seam line that is inevitably going to be created by attaching two pieces together most likely. But yeah, I basically always keep things things separate until the last possible second that I need them to then be in one piece. And at that point, I tend to use my super glue and E6000 trick. E6000 tends to be a bit stronger of an adhesive than super glue. At least it's a bit more flexible, so it tends to hold up a bit better. But the problem is this stuff takes forever to dry. So the way to get around that and get the strongest possible bond on your pieces is to put E6000 
frozen in the center of the piece and then go around the edges with super glue. And that means the super glue will harden and dry and assemble the pieces much faster, but it will still over time then have the added strength of the E6000. So this tends to be the method that I use for assembling all of my pieces when it is large enough to sort of be able to put this in the center and this around the outside. However, if it is a piece that I'm incredibly paranoid about, or it's just generally a trickier piece to assemble for whatever reason, for instance, like pieces of a helmet, I do this to a lot. JB Weld. Now, in most cases, I use this as sort of like a seam filler on the inside of, say, a helmet. So I will still use something like super glue and E6000 to actually bond the pieces together, but then to make sure those pieces stay together, make that attachment point as strong as possible, I will spread JB Weld all over the seam on the inside of the piece, and it makes it, like, indestructible. I've done this to many a helmet, and it has held up perfectly well. This is also how I like to attach the T-nuts to install Mandalorian helmet helmet visors. Just a very versatile product to have around for those extra adhesive moments that you might need. So that is everything that I can think of in terms of my more prep work tools. So now let's get into the painting section. The first things are kind of in the middle between the prep work and painting, and it's mostly in the case that if I don't want something to be this gray color of the filler primer, I will then spray the pieces in either the black or white version of this. But this stuff is really easy to use. It doesn't sag, very easy to spray, like a very non-problematic spray paint, and it is a primer paint combo, and it really works well as a base coat. I've never had any paint have a problem with sticking to this stuff. It does come in quite a lot of colors. It just, again, I tend to either start with a gray, white, or black base and the filler primer is the gray, and when that doesn't work, it's one of these. I'm gonna start with more painting tools, and then we will get into actual paint. The first thing is my custom helmet painting stand, although I have used this for things other than helmets, like alien heads, but I wanted to devise a better helmet painting stand than just having like a pole situation, so this is fully adjustable. There is a video on my channel about how I made this. It's super easy. It utilizes these tripod poles, so it's completely modular. You can have this work for any possible project that you can think of that needs a type of painting stand like this. And I will sit this on like a Lazy Susan so that it's really easy to spin around. I do use the more remedial version of this for the priming work, like a wood plaque that has some sort of wooden dowel and a cap for priming helmets and any of that sort of prep work. This is for like the final painting stages when I really want to have that adjustability factor just to make my life a lot easier when painting different size pieces. I did sort of touch on this before, but masking fluid. It's like a liquid latex, which you can actually use instead of proper masking fluid. It tends to be for traditional artwork like watercolor and ink and this stops paint from getting on a certain area, so you can use it for chipping or just generally when you want to mask off an area and something like a tape won't work. Maybe, you know, you want a more organic shape, you want to paint on a shape. This stuff is awesome. Like I mentioned, I like putting it in one of those needle nose squeeze bottles. It's really convenient to use those for applying this stuff. And something that's very similar to this that I don't think a lot of people actually know about is masking film. Now masking film can come in super handy when you want a very specific shape. So this as you can see is quite a large roll so you can really cut out whatever shapes that you need to mask off with this. If you want to take it one step even further you can actually use something like a Cricut machine to die cut this out so that it's super precise. I know some people use different types of vinyl for the same idea for masking really complex shapes. It can just 
just be a really handy and versatile thing to have around if you are wanting to mask off a very specific and complex shape where tape is just going to take you forever to try and achieve the same results with. Of course, speaking of tape, I do use a variety of different masking tapes, which aren't that exciting to talk about, but I did want to talk about this stuff. This is the Tamaya Masking Tape for Curves. I have it at, I think, every size it comes in, and it is absolutely incredible. It is this flexible, stretchy tape, and as the name would suggest, it is meant for curves. So when you need to put tape down on anything that is a curved surface, where more traditional masking tape just will not lay down well. This will give you an absolutely flawless masking line and will curve to whatever shape you could possibly need. But my absolute favorite painting tool is definitely my airbrush. At this point I've accumulated quite a few different airbrush guns but I always go back to my Awada Eclipse. This is what you will see me using in 90% of my videos. It's just really reliable. It has the like a perfect nozzle size for most of the projects that I work on. I can do really precise work with it, but I can also use it for very large areas. It cleans really well. It's just an overall great airbrush. That being said though, recently I've been using this TimberTech airbrush, which this thing is 30 Canadian dollars. The Awada one is definitely like 300 plus. And this thing honestly works just as well as this. And it also comes with multiple nozzle and cup configurations. It's incredible. The only thing that I would say with this one is the build quality isn't as nice as this one, which honestly is kind of expected considering it is like a tenth of the price. But for that, I absolutely cannot complain about this. This would be an awesome airbrush to try out if you are someone that's looking at possibly purchasing an airbrush and and I know a lot of the time people seem to be paranoid that they're going to mess it up somehow and so I'm sure everyone can agree that they would much rather mess up a $30 airbrush gun compared to a $300 airbrush gun. 90% of this airbrush feels just as nice as the Iwata one. The only thing is the back portion of it is plastic and not metal. I haven't done a super thorough uh, disassembly and clean out of this, so I can't say how well over time this might hold up compared to this one. Like, this one I have fully clogged up multiple times over and I have been able to clean it out and getting it back to working. But for the price of this one, it's an incredible option and definitely a really awesome secondary airbrush gun, especially considering it has all of those different nozzle size options. So if I'm working on a project that I need two very different nozzle sizes for different parts of the project, then these are going to be the two airbrushes that I use. And for my air compressor, I have an Awada Studio Series something or another that I will put the exact model here of. <laughs> but that's just what came with my Eclipse airbrush. I didn't touch on paintbrushes at all because I really just use whatever synthetic brush I have in my studio that I feel will do the job. But now let's get into the paint, which honestly I could do an entire separate video on because it's such an in-depth topic, but the short form version of the paint that I use is this. First off, which probably makes up the majority of the type of paint that I use, which is going to be quite shocking, is just cheap craft paint. This is the stuff that I tend to thin down with airbrush medium and stuff and use in my airbrush. I do have actual different types of airbrush paints as well that I use and I will mix in with the craft paint because the airbrush paint can be super densely pigmented so it makes for like a great mix in when I want to slightly tint the colors and just mix things things up and stuff, especially because it's also like a more liquidy consistency, so it just helps with the overall paint mixture. Yes, most of the paint that you will see me using is just the inexpensive acrylic to craft paint. And this is coming from someone that fully understands, as normally a professional traditional painter, the importance of quality paints. But for the most part, when it comes to model and acrylic paint, the cheap stuff can tend to be just as good as the more expensive model, like painting specific stuff. Obviously there's all like pigment density, blah, 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 whatever, but 
the craft paint will work. On top of the inexpensive craft paint, I do have some other kinds that I use from time to time, especially when I just need a little bit of one color or I'm doing any hand painting, including various Tamiya ones, which I will also thin down and use in my airbrush. And I have accumulated a collection of various army painter and Vallejo, like more traditional model painting types of paint. These I tend to use for smaller scale work or when I only need a little bit of a color like painting eyeballs on a creature or anything like that. There is however one type of paint that I will fully be willing to splurge on and that is metallic paint. Having paint look like actual metal is something that is incredibly difficult to accurately achieve. In some cases it is also how you prep the surface of what you're painting, like having a glossy flawless surface also helps a lot. One of my favorite types of metallic paint that I've been using lately is this Vallejo metal color stuff. It is incredibly convincing. I find that with less expensive metallic paints it has that shimmer glitter to it that just really does not come off as looking like metal, but this stuff does not have that at all. It comes in a ton of different colors. It also comes in a quite reasonably sized bottle, and this comes off very convincingly like metal. If I need something to look incredibly chrome and flawless looking, the Alcalde Alclad 2 Chrome is incredible. The Alclad 2 paints also come in a variety of metallic colors. The chrome is sort of the staple color. It's very, very chrome and flawless looking. It also can be recolored really easily. Something that might actually come off even more chrome-like would be the Molotow Liquid Chrome. This is actually a marker refill and this stuff is like mirror in a bottle. You can see it all over the nozzle there. That is not a metal tip, that is just the paint. Sometimes this is like almost too flawless and chrome-like, but when you need something to look like that, this is awesome. And the final metallic paint that I use all of the time, given the subject matter that I tend to be working on, is Duralumin. This is quite literally Beskar in a bottle. It is one of the nicest metallic paints I have ever used. This is like an Aluma Luster alternative, which until recently I didn't actually know I could get in Canada, but I think I can actually order it. Yeah, this stuff is awesome. If you are needing anything to look like Beskar, this is the way to go. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> a sort of specific paint that I use would be my DIY black wash, which I mixed up this bottle a long time ago. I just watched one of the really popular videos on YouTube of how to make your own black wash, and I didn't have half of the stuff so I just sort of winged it, but this stuff works great. <laughs> when I run out of it I will DIY some more. It's just really awesome in making things look dirty and weathered. Very easy to use and if you don't have any black wash laying around then I would highly recommend you look up a video and make some because you will absolutely use this at some point. And those are all of my must-have tools, at least that I can remember because I've probably forgotten something. I would absolutely love to know any of your recommendations so please feel free to leave those in the comment section. But that is everything, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.